distinguished guests, distinguished participants. With thanks to the opening ceremony of the Fort Uluda Economy Summit, we are again here in such a beautiful environment with you today. Uluda Economy Summit has developed very much from the first day it was organized, and the numbers of the participants increased. And right now, we know that this Uluda Economy Summit actually acquires much more an international identity. And Uluda Economy Summit became actually an activity which was followed on the international level. I would like to thank the uh, Capital uh, Economist magazines for organizing such an event, and I would like to congratulate them for organizing such a successful event. I mentioned in the first Uludağ Economy Summit as well, Turkey can compete with the international market very easily. And when Turkey is compared in the uh, international uh, level, uh, Turkey has many capacities and many skills, and organizational skills are one of them. And such organizations, such summits, are very important, are very enlightening for the policies that are going to be taken in the future for Turkey, because all of the discussions and all of the acquaintance uh, and all of the networking in such uh, summits are providing many advantages to our participants. Today, we are organizing the uh, fourth Uludağ Economy Summit, and in my speech I will uh, speak about the global agenda, and I would like to speak about uh, our perspectives about the global agenda on behalf of a G20 member, and I will speak about what will the Turkey's contribution to the global agenda on behalf of the G20. Of course, I will make a short review about the Turkish economy, and then I will uh, speak about our preparations for the future, and I will speak about what kind of uh, policies we have uh, for the future in Turkish economy. From the onset of the global economic crisis till now, we have spent approximately seven or eight years we always said that if the crisis are stemming from the financial crisis, they had a bigger impact and they last l longer. And we still have the impacts of the financial crisis. As you all remember, the 2007 and 2008 financial crisis are still posing some impacts, some negative impacts in many uh, countries. I can st uh, start making my assessment from the Europe, the European continent. The European continent, uh, the European Union specifically, has a trend of uh, growth with uh, a very uh, low numbers. And the European Union has a problem of inflation right now. And when, it, when we come to the Japan, uh, there is an economic recession which is aligned with the deflation. And this risk is also shared by the European Union. And this risk is actually determined and observed by the European Central Bank. And the European Central Bank conducted some non-conventional measures. And the European Central Bank tried to provide the dynamism to the European economy by taking some monetary policies. But of course, the central banks cannot provide the uh, empl uh, employment and also the growth 
on their own because the monetary policy is just one part of this three pillar structure because when you are speaking about the economic policies you have to speak about three pillars which are very important fiscal policies is one of them I mean the issues with regards to the budget the monetary policies are constituting this uh, secondary uh, pillar and the infrastructural reforms are constituting the third pillar if uh, the measures in those three pillars are not taken in coordination with each other, then the countries cannot actually reach to success in their economies. And the biggest problems of the European Union, uh, the European continent, is stemming from uh, their uh, inability to conduct the infrastructural reforms. In the last two years, the public debt was the biggest problem for the European continent, and we were always discussing about these public debts. But the European uh, central banks declared that we will provide liquidity to the market, and uh, after that declaration, we uh, believe that uh, th there is going to be a strong bailout problem for the banks. Uh, this debt problem uh, has been hidden to some extent, but this debt problem is not solved in the uh, European continent either. But as long as the countries know that there is a debt problem and in the uh, and the European Central Bank will be there to save them, it provides actually a, a palliative effect. But this actually creates uh, an imbalance because there are some uh, countries in the European Union which are taking very strong measures, but the other countries which uh, are not uh, taking uh, ground measures, then uh, it creates a problem because uh, the trend in the European Union is uh, right uh, now as follows. One of the countries are following uh, very loose fiscal policies, but the other ones are actually uh, following very strong uh, conventional uh, measures. The moral hazard, our banking, uh, bankers know it very well, but this uh, situation, this imbalance, this unjust application in the European Union is posing a moral hazard for them. Of, of course, this is their problem, but uh, I mean, since we are tr trading with them, it is a huge concern for us. In recent years, the EU government has been implementing new policies. Actually, they call them three arrows, not three pillars as we call them. They use a new terminology. And the third arrow was structural reforms where things are not going fine. So we still have that about whether recovery will follow. Back on the US side, within all developed economies, we see that the fastest recovery is achieved by the US, especially the drop in energy prices has been a leading factor for US's reindustrialization. Newly built energy plants can now manufacture energy at costs like one or two cents and add the intellectual accumulation on top of that you can see that there is a powerful recovery on the way. But as a result, the EU Federal Reserve is now going for a tighter monetary policy in order to transition from an extraordinary state to an ordinary one. So in the next years, we are going to have to follow that point closely as well. At the earliest in June this year, or by the end of the year, the cycle of it increasing interest rates is going to bring together a wave of fluctuation all around the world. Even the news of increasing interest rates will be noticeable by everyone because even the expectation has its reflections on financial indicators. You can see the impact most noticeably in the Euro-dollar parity. 
the tighter policy expectation is now putting dollar against all other commodities and indicators like gold prices. But if you take an inverse look, the devaluation of all other factors strengthens dollar even further. Also, the Federal Reserve's decisions when coupled with the U uh, European Central Bank's decisions, we can say that the Euro-Dollar parity is going to uh, change even further. Back in the day, the parity was quite low, but since 1999, we have seen 0 0.8 and 1.6. Last year, it was maximum 1.4, but nowadays it's around 1.6. Last week, it was 1.10. I mean, there can be a fluctuation by up to 0 0.5 in terms of euros value uh, against dollars or vice versa. This is such a high volatility and it's hard to manage. When this will stop or when this will become normal is actually a discussion where everyone has a different say. It is like a lottery between the euro and the dollar. Even the European Central Bank's president or the Federal Reserve's president, as well as their technical staff, do not know when this will stop. As to their wishes, they might have their uh, projections, but they cannot establish 100% control. This is the uncertainty that is going on all around the world, and it has its reflections on developed and emerging markets like us. Within the last three to four weeks, there were fluctuations in the exchange rate, and our own discussions probably led to a rise in the exchange rate as well. But from Brazil to India, from Indonesia to South Africa or Mexico, these market fluctuations are observed. This was not intrinsic only to us, I mean the fluctuation in the last three to four weeks if you are following international markets you will have realized it as well now let's take a look at emerging markets problems are quite big in magnitude their growth rate when compared to the last decade is going down and it will go even further currently 9% uh, or 10% growth rate is just a dream. Now countries are thinking about 7% at best. And for the next 10 years, OECD expects around 5% growth rate for China. That single child policy is going to hit China so bad after a while that the growth rate might be as bad as one or uh, two percent long-term projections show that on the brazilian side at the other side which is a, a part of the BRIC countries three to four years ago the BRIC countries were uh, announced as the stars of the world but on the brazilian side we have a budget deficit of six percent growth rate is stagnant and every new measure taken in order to increase the growth rate leads to public demonstrations. Corruption scandals and foul management is now creating a, a different Brazil that is different, different than last year's. The uh, interest rate had to be increased up to 12.75%, but even that does not provide stabilization. In Indonesia, also low growth rate is a problem. The mean growth rate of Latin America tells us that it is around 1 to 2.5%. So in terms of emerging markets, the picture is not as bright as it used to be, but we have to also mention the fact that in the next decade, growth rates of emerging markets is going to be lower than the last decade, but they will be still higher than 
developed countries. This means emerging markets are still going to be dynamic places where investment opportunities are present. Briefly, this is what we can infer from the global picture. Of course, the dropping oil prices is another important point to be taken into consideration. On the global, global economy, the dropping oil prices have a positive impact, actually. It will give them, all countries, actually, a little bit of boost, but things will change from country to country including Russia, some of the oil producers are being negatively influenced. But countries like us, which have to heavily import natural gas or oil, the impact is going to be positive. As for our G20 agenda, three years ago, we were elected 2015's G20 leader. Well, you have to have all uh, 20 countries votes in order to get to that position and we achieved that this year we uh, announced our priorities with the three E's first is uh, inclusiveness second implementations three I's by, by the way I correct the third is investments under the scope of inclusiveness, we make emphasis on SMEs. The G20 has 11 agendas. We uh, overtook them from the Austrian uh, leader. But as part of all these 11 items, we still have to think about SME, SMEs. We requested from the International Chamber of Commerce to create an SME uh, assembly. And the uh, TUCC is part of uh, this assembly. As you know, the uh, Global Chamber of Commerce is the widest economic structure of the world. So a global SME forum hopefully with their consent and with our support is going to be founded in the next years. This is going to be a permanent platform and for the first time on an international level it is going to be a place where SMEs can speak out about their problems as well as recommendations. Also under the title of inclusiveness we are thinking about uh, low developed countries, underdeveloped countries they are still going to be under our focus. Of, of course, G20 represents 85% of global economy, 75% of global uh, trade. We have emerging and developed countries among us, but we have about 180 countries outside the G20 circle. So in order not to appear like we are only representative of these 20 countries, we want to go beyond the perception. We want to show the world that G20 is a platform where even non-members problems are being discussed. So there is also a broad scope of consent next to our SME scope our 20 members widely approve of representing these other countries in our agendas too in the ministries meeting there was a consensus about addressing this point too another point about inclusiveness is the w 20 which is women 20 for the first time this was also proposed by turkey in the latest summit in Austria, we spoke out loud about this proposition in order to make sure that we can increase the activity of women and women entrepreneurs through common policies 
and well-established international policies. In the meeting back in November, as the next term president, we want to bring it on the table once again. But as I said, we need a consensus to make this real. So we wanted all members to start thinking about it. In the month of March, March we want to finalize it. In this month's SHAPA meeting, we want to create a framework. We have actually created a framework document, and SHAPAs of these 20 countries will take a look at this. If we can reach a consensus, this incentive is going to start to, and then governments of all these 20 countries will have uh, made decisions about stronger approach towards women's role in uh, the commercial world and in the business world. And this mechanism is going to become a permanent one for G20 under our efforts. Our second priority is implementation. Many countries have actually come up with solutions about what to do. They have announced them, but we are still having drawbacks when it comes to implementation. It's easy to announce what you want to do, but when you take a look at the implementation side, especially if you require risky political decisions, it is not so easy. These 20 countries have already laid out on the table of G20 what they want to do in, in terms of structural reforms. All 20 countries did this already. In 2015, we want to do something else to create a monitoring mechanism so that through this mechanism we can see how well these countries implement the decisions made. Maybe we can create a scoreboard-like system to see their success. Being monitored from outside and having your performance measured, we believe is going to uh, encourage reforms. Some of the countries are not convinced, actually, but the latest meeting was good in terms of that. OECD and IMF will be the monitoring uh, mechanism as impartial international mechanisms. We want to uh, make the mechanism effective by the end of the year as a result of Turkish leadership. Third, we have investments. Investments are not a point only for developed countries, but also for emerging markets. Only if investments are made in a wise manner, then you can see the benefits and outcomes of that investment for years to come. You cannot rely solely on construction sector's growth. Each cent spent by the government and each cent invested into infrastructural reforms is not of the same value. Take a look at developed countries around the world. Usually you will see highly inefficient local and regional investments. It's not like any investment will yield great results. Resources are not abundant. Many countries are strug struggling with debt issues, so you have to prioritize. Some countries do not even have a fiscal area. If you ask them to, uh, say, spend $1 billion more, they will say that they are shrinking and they cannot afford it. Afford it. This means public resources are becoming more important. They have to be mobilized for private investments. International finance institutions have been assigned for this purpose in order to standardize PPPs financially, t financially and technically as well as legally. 
so that we can standardize and uh, simplify them for uh, investors. We want to strengthen the legal framework so that private sector is not afraid to make investments. And we want to see how we can securitize this. In the end, we want to have a standardized and facilitated means of involving investors into investment on securities. Our G20 agenda is more or less like this in brief. Of course, we have a great team that is dealing with these issues in Turkey. We have B20, the Business 20, and L20 for laborers, the labor world, so that their uh, views are reflected to G20. We also have T20. And these groups are going to keep emerging in the future too. As these uh, periods later, we are the leader of B20, L20, and T20. This means hard work and intensive shifts are ahead of us in the future too. Valuable guests, valuable participants. I would also like to make a brief evaluation of Turkey, if I may. Since the year 2002, Turkey has undergone a significant transformation. And this transformation itself became not only political, but also social and economy. When you compare 2002's Turkey to today's Turkey, the comparison is hard to make because the end result is quite uh, advanced. We have a finer democracy now and also uh, in comparison to 2002, fundamental rights are being implemented better and our economy is far better, especially EU reforms and harmonization with the EU on the basis of EU criteria have changed the picture in Turkey drastically. With the uh, EU anchor in place, safe and sound, we want to continue with these reforms. This is because each country may call itself a democratic country. Each country may call itself a good democratic, democratic environment where human rights are practiced. But becoming a legal country is not as easy as this. Similarly, each country may say, I have a constitution, I, ha I have a legal framework. But in reality, when it comes to legal practices and implementation of human rights, you have to have an internationally comparable success achieved already. This is why an external anchor, a mirror which you can see yourself in, is quite important. It is not sufficient for a country to call itself a democratic republic. We have to see whether universal democracy is reigning over the world in all countries. At this point, we have already realized some significant reforms, but that is still not adequate. This is why in the next period, a new constitution is going to be one of the primary articles and items on our agenda. We want to create a constitution from scratch. It has to be easily understandable by each individual. individuals. We have to refrain from gray areas. We want to have a clear one that is understandable. Of course, international legal frameworks and principles have to reign in this constitution. Uh, United Nations, European Council, European Union, they are based on legal frameworks tested for years and decades in different geographical areas. Of course, you also have 
bad norms which still require uh, improvisation, improvements actually. So we have to take the best norms, best functioning ones as a reference in order to have democracy in the centric focal point in our constitution. In that regard, the upcoming period is going to be critical. If we can achieve a parliamentary composition that can achieve a new constitution, it is going to be a great a democratic opportunity for Turkey. Stability is quite important for a nation, of course. But what kind of stability are we talking about? There are different ways of obtaining it. You can be a pressurizing regime to do it, as you can see in some countries. This is why we don't want to do that. We want to become a democratic, stabilizing power. If you take a look at the uh, vicinity, you will see that many countries are struggling in a great deal of instability. But take a look at a decade or two decades ago in those countries, you will realize that there were no free environments, there was oppression, but there was political stability. That was how they achieved it. You can say that this is a good argument because they were uh, creating uh, security at the expense of freedom, but as you can see, they are in shambles now. So in the next years to come, we want to have a sustainable stability based on freedom. Stability should be established in an environment where freedoms are enjoyed freely. All rights and freedoms have to be secured, absolutely. And the uh, right of rule, the rule of law, has to be practiced 100%. These are points which are going to continue to have importance for us in the next years. The rule of law, legal security, as I have mentioned, these have to be the roof of not only our constitution but all laws that uh, are accommodated in a country. This is what we are going to achieve in the next period. We have to refrain from gray areas, both in laws and the Constitution. All uh, acquired rights have to be protected 100%, and legal processes have to uh, continue without any hindrances in an effective manner. Only if you can achieve that, then we can become a truly legally free country for a first class democracy that has to be achieved for an advanced economy that still has to be achieved if in a country law is lacking democracy alone is not going to suffice without law democracy may even lead you to chaos without law the power of the people may become meaningless after a while. Without the rule of law in a country, you may have wealthy people, but you cannot have an overall wealthy people. Because there will always be people who can thrive on injustice. You may have billionaires abusing the lack of welfare. Then in that environment, you cannot talk about social wealth. Without the rule of law in that country, development and welfare cannot even be thought of. This is why one of the biggest reforms we are going to realize next uh, is going to be in the judiciary field. As you know, three of our ministers had to be uh, leaving their positions due to constitutional regulations and the Ministry of Justice is now creating a draft judiciary uh, reform. It is just a draft at the moment. 
there are some nice points, nice approaches for solutions. Maybe we may not discuss it before elo elections in a full scale, but before the elections, one of our big priorities is still going to be a judiciary reform, which is drastically needed in this country. Once we can achieve that, we can eliminate the environment where trust in the judiciary system is uh, re-established. The latest events, such as the events of uh, the December of 17 to 25th of December, you can have your own perspective, but this process wounded Turkey in terms of trust in the judiciary system, mainly. A parallel structure within the state using the judiciary system wanted to achieve its own goals within this process. And it resulted in a troublesome period for Turkey. This is unforgivable in itself. Therefore, the judicial system has to be functioning based on the free will of judicial members such as lawyers and jurists. At this point, from education to human resources and monitoring mechanisms, we are going to have to deal with a lot of different issues. Valuable guests and participants. Education is another point of reform for us. In 2012, on the first occasion of Uluda Economy Summit, I shared my opinions with you. And then in 2013 and 14, I also shared my views with you, but I always kept on talking about education. In the last 12 years, uh, Quantitatively, the statistics are quite fine. Now we have one teacher per every 20 uh, students in our high schools at the moment, and we have 900,000 teachers in total. The mean number of students available in a class has dropped down to 30, and thanks to the Fatih project, the physical infrastructure has been improved. In the upcoming period, we have to start emphasizing on quality, not in high schools and secondary schools only, also in the higher education side. Following the elections, we are going to have steps taken. Currently, we have a team creating an education reform package without being affected by the daily winds of the agenda, they are thinking on what is the right thing to do, to develop a perspective. Only through a well-educated population can we uh, achieve better income per capita and a developed economy. So about our economic policies, usually we build these on the foundation of trust. If they try trust and reliability, things become easier. Without that reliability, whatever you may do, growth and employment rates will not be improved. So how can you establish that trust? We have some valuable members of the business world among us today. For about 30, 40, for even uh, 50 years they have been gaining experience so they know very well that making a, co a company a reliable company and with good reputation takes a lot to do and this is the same for a, a country's government too you have to make promises but you have to fulfill them too and never make a promise that you cannot fulfill. All your undertakings, takings, uh, be it uh, an order undertaking or an economic undertaking, it has to be uh, realized. 
when you are announcing a goal, a program, it has to be realized. You have to work hard until that takes place. In a transparent environment, with a transparent approach, you have to manage your promise, promises. With transparency and the illumination of light, you can never go wrong. The more transparent your public management is, the less corruption and wrongdoings are going to be. Of course, accountability is another important foundation for being reliable. Back to the three pillars about Turkey in the field of fiscal policies. Last year, we had a budget deficit of 1.3% and our debt ratio to uh, national income is 33%. And now we have even uh, announced growth goals for the year 2023, and only few countries can do that. We can project our future. Can you see any negative news about uh, the public debt of Turkey? Can you think about the Treasury's insol insolvency? I am not even seeing such news on the newspapers anymore. There are tenders worth 5 to 8 billion liras, and uh, this debt is now being mentioned in only a few lines on the economy pages. But in the past, you would see that these tenders would take pages on the economy pages. But this is no longer a concern. This is why the public uh, finance side of these three pillars is quite sound for us. As for structural reforms, reforms we have announced 25 transformation packages for 2018. Under them, we have over 1,200 actions with scheduled times. During the prime ministry of our uh, president of republic, we had a 10-year development plan. It has been detailed even further, and now we have a realization schedule. Based on that calendar and based on the four press meetings by our uh, prime minister, this has become a political undertaking taking for us. So structural reforms can now be projected for the future too. Also, we have three month uh, progress frameworks too. So in periods of three months, we are going to announce our uh, progress. And it is not really easy for a political government. You are exposing yourself, you are making hard commitments, and you are putting yourself under the light. But we are doing it. As long as we continue to uh, do it in a stable manner, we will uh, be all right. On the third pillar, we have monetary policies. We want to work on projectability in this side because there are uncertainties that need to be tackled. The central bank is the uh, body in charge. Of course, the government draws out, outlines the general framework, and the uh, actions to be taken are collectively decided on by the central uh, bank and the government. But there is an instrumental independence by the central uh, bank. It has its own area of freedom. At that point, currently, we require projectability. If possible, communication, even only by the central bank side, can lead to trustworthy applications. If we can render this third pillar more safe and sound, there will be nothing to worry about Turkey's future. Even if fluctuations may happen all around the world, even if we are going through a tough period in terms of global finance. As long as we implement the right policies, there will be nothing to fear. We only have to know what we are going for and aiming for, for and 
we have to be prepared for all types of scenario at times of high uncertainty based on uh, specific expectations you cannot take actions let's say that in the next year the oil price is fifty dollars and if you have scheduled a program for sixty dollars you cannot move the price may change the price may drop it may stay stable but under all circumstances you need to have a contingency plan the euro dollar parity rate the exchange rate uh, is it going to the parity rate drop down to 1.0 is it going to drop to 0 0.8 well you have to project that ahead of time because everything is possible and you have to be ready the primary perspective is to work on different scenarios for preparation achieving that will make sure that we have uh, a free area to move in in the next years to come this year next year and in a previous year let's take a look at Turkey's economic per performance last year we had a figure a little bit below 3% actually uh, by the end of March actually the Turkish Statistical Institute is going to give us the final details because especially the agricultural data is not collected easily but employment rates of the last year are now final last year we had an increase by one about 1.5 million people in employment and the growth rate in employment is 8.5 percent this is extraordinarily great and this tells us that the private sector is still taking sound steps for the future we can still employ people but we also have an increased participation rate in employment the increase is 1.3 percent and there is no country around the world with such a rapid growth rate especially women's participation in the work power increased a lot currently uh, university graduate females have an equal rate of participation in uh, uh, the workforce as males this year out of uh, every employed university graduates out of every 100 university graduates 46 of them women but we have to back this up with permanent structural uh, reforms so that growth continues and uh, employment is not stagnated on our agenda of structural reforms for the next year we have 25 titles i will share them with you and and my words first we have productivity and production efficiency this means we need to have a growth rate based on productivity we don't want an artificial growth rate you cannot keep increasing the risk for the future by increasing debt rates of individuals and companies this will be only artificial the structural side of this potential growth has to be sound leave exports aside now in our uh, own dynamics our growth potential seems to be three percent and as you increase your exports this increases as well as for prospective risk accumulation in the current deficit side you cannot create a sustainable growth because that will not allow you to uh, leverage your potential growth rate second we have reducing uh, import dependency third we have prevention of waste and increasing savings our savings are low last year we increased it by 1.5 percent 
and our current deficit rate decreased from 7 percent. With the influence of uh, the oil prices, we believe that the, our current account deficit rate is going to drop down to 4 percent. We want Istanbul to become an international finance center fit. We want to rationalize public sa uh, sa spendings. Seven, we have improvement of employment environments. These all have 50 to 60 actions under each of them with scheduled completion rates. I'm talking about quite a thick book-like document. Currently, they are being translated as well. Eight, activating the workforce uh, market. Education-related related problems in uh, uh, employment and so on. Nine, reducing informal labor. Then we have uh, commercialization in the prioritized technology areas. Well, you can carry on with our research and development, but you have to capitalize on that too. Spending a lot on research and development is important, but if you're not gaining anything out of it, it is just a breeze. You have listened to the CEO of Samsung before me. He talked about research and development and how to capitalize on it. Twelve, we have supporting local production through public loans. Twelve, we have energy production on local area. Fourteen, we have increasing energy efficiency. Fifteen, we have usage of water in agriculture. Well, we can talk about these, but I will just skip them first. We have health industries, transformation. We have a transformation from transportation to logistics. Then we have being a center of attraction for qualified people. This is an important perspective for Turkey. Qualified people, regardless of their religions, uh, nations, and so on, we would like to attract these people healthy life and mobility, uh, protecting family structure, then we have strengthening corporate capacity, and then the social harmony coupled with urban transformation. We want to move from the classical approach of social, uh, urban transformation in a manner that it uh, consolidates social harmony. 25, we have international uh, collaboration infrastructure being consolidated for development. As you know, last year we had foreign aids delivered outside country uh, with a worth of $3.5 billion, and we became the third after U.S. and Britain in terms of humanitarian aids delivered outside national borders. Now the neighborhood approach has changed. Uh, at the moment, wherever there is a nation in need around the world, it is still going to be a neighbor for you because if your neighbor is hungry, you cannot afford to be full. This is what our tradition tells us. Our national reputation, international reputation as well, also benefits, but we mainly view this as a humanitarian burden on our shoulders that we want to carry in the future too. So as I conclude, I wish you a fruitful summit today and tomorrow. I am going to be leaving soon, but output of the meeting is going to be delivered to me in the form of a summary by Mr. Ralph. I want to see what kind of new ideas and recommendations for us and the business world uh, will be for us at the end of the summit. So thank you for listening to me.